there's probably nothing more important in my thinking. Well, in the framework of the scripture, the way I see it, there's nothing more important than divine order. And there's nothing more important to the church than having homes that function in divine order. Uh, people want the or, the glory and the beauty and the splendor and the blessing of order, but unfortunately, many people don't want to pay the price of that divine order. So that is why it's absolutely essential that each person understand roles and responsibilities. Uh, just think about the chaos of a classroom of, of fourth graders, because nobody in the classroom understands roles and responsibilities, right? Um, and the teacher is not going to execute any kind of authority in that classroom or doesn't have the ability to, it isn't going to be a good thing. They are not going to gather together for the better, but for the worse. Um, no one's going to learn anything. And besides that, a lot of people are going to get hurt. Reality, the same thing is going on in every area of our life. It, it may not have as a dramatic effect um, at first glance when wives don't want to obey their husbands and when husbands do not want to obey Christ Jesus. But the effect is as profound when wives do not want to obey their husbands as much as when men do not want to obey Christ. We can all easily conclude that when a man does not want to obey Christ, he's lost. He's vulnerable to every satanic force He's vulnerable to every power of darkness. And ultimately, besides that, he's completely out of a relationship and fellowship that's going to bring anything uh, uh, that will uh, vaguely uh, simil have a similitude of life and blessing. There's no blessing outside of relationship with Jesus. And every area of divine order is, is that essential. When people begin to deal with this concept that somehow the man has the right to have more place, more position, more authority in the relationship than the woman, unfortunately, it gets um, spun completely out of control and it's not viewed the way it ought to be viewed. It's a protective thing. But before that, it's just simply, before you start trying to get into the, to the intellectual reasoning about why a man should be in charge of his house, it's what God wants. <laughs> I mean, it should really actually enforce right there. It is so clear in the scripture that God demands a man to take the position of leadership in his household. It's absolutely the responsibility of a man to present his house before God, to teach his children, his sons, and for to train his sons to teach their sons. And um, if that divine order somehow seems to be less than what's desirable or attractive, then the reality of it is deception has come to play in our hearts and in our lives. Too many people will come into church and they will want to have the blessings, the benefits, the glory of the anointing of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. Everybody's fascinated about the gifts of the Spirit, the operation of the Holy Ghost and flowing in the anointing. But somehow, they don't recognize that there is a divine order, that there are responsibilities, that there's obedience to the Word of God before that's ever going to happen. If we're not willing to cooperate with, with God, if we're not willing to take a hold of fundamental rules like serving one another, if we're not willing to take a hold of fundamental rules like obeying authorities, recognizing the authority, if we're not willing to walk in humility, if we're not willing to walk in love, we're completely isolated from anything God is doing. There's no way for us to in any way connect with what the Holy Spirit is doing. Because if it's not humility, if it's not servitude, if it's not love, if it's not submission, it is rebellion and anarchy 
and stubbornness and defiance and arrogance and all of those things which God names that he absolutely hates. So the reality of it is when we are converted and we become like little children and we become those who are obedient children of the Lord, the idea of having such love and affection and servitude and submission in our own houses should be easy. That shouldn't be something weird or distorted or in somehow unreasonable because the fact of it is the transformation of life that has taken place makes you a person that esteems others better than yourself. How much more should a wife be able to esteem um, her husband better than herself? Well, you may say, well, the same goes the other way. Well, the husband needs to be esteeming the wife better than himself. Well, yeah, and an affection, and there's many things to talk about in terms of that affection and the way that the man should lay down his life for his wife. But it isn't the first question that ought to enter into that submissive woman's mind. It isn't in any way going to negate the fact that Adam was not deceived. I want you to think about this. Adam was not deceived. The woman was deceived. And so, therefore, the Lord demands by the mouth of Paul, and also he himself refers to it, that this is why a woman can't teach. This is why a woman cannot take a place of authority over a man and say, no, we're not going to do it that way. We're going to do it this way. Fundamentally, That is out of divine order. And so, therefore, when that is going on in the household, the result is going to be chaos. It is not going to be blessing. Your children are not going to be raised up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. They're not going to be raised up in an atmosphere where the anointing is there. They are being nurtured by the Holy Ghost. They are being... Um, affected by the presence of the Lord that causes them to develop properly. In fact, the anointing and the presence of God is more essential for right development spiritually in a child than food is for that child's physical development. And not only is it more important for the development, it's more essential. I want you to think about that. What if the child doesn't get proper nutrition? Well, that's That is absolutely the worst thing you could possibly think of doing to your child. They're going to have so many problems. They're going to create a disease state for themselves. They're not going to physically develop right. They're not going to develop right um, uh, mentally either. Well, spiritually, when you don't have divine order in your house, when you want to shortcut the, the ways of God, when you don't want to have roles and responsibilities in your house, (laughs) <laughs> the reality of it is your children are not going to rise up and call you blessed. Fact of it is, proof over and over again, your children are going to despise you. They're not going to respect you. And then you're all of a sudden <clears throat> shocked that somehow your child doesn't know its place. <clears throat> somehow you're shocked that your child is dishonoring you and disrespecting you and completely out of order. Well, I wonder where that order problem came from. It came, reality, it came from the fact that the wife did not want to be in submission to the husband. Um, listen, <laughs> I would guess that the majority of homes, the majority of households, do not have proper authority. They do not have proper recognition of God's divine order. Well, <clears throat> When the man's not willing to stand up and say, no, this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to take my place that God has given me. And this is the way it's going to be in my house. Honey, I love you dearly, but we're going to walk this way and we're going to do it this way. The children are going to do these things. And obviously, if the wife is submissive and she has a meek and a quiet spirit, which is a great price in the eyes of the Lord. And she has been converted and become like a little child. And she has a heart of humility and a heart of brokenness and a heart of 
of sincerity towards God that results in that lowliness of mind and that submission one to another, she's going to say, absolutely, I'm right there with you. The attitude is going to be so perfect. The relationship is going to be so perfect that the husband is going to continually be seeking out advice from the wife as to what the best thing is to do. I guarantee you that. But how about, how about the issue of so many men that are in the church, they have totally abdicated from their responsibilities. They've totally abdicated from taking a stand. They would rather say, uh, you know, I just don't want to get into the argument. I just don't want to get into the dispute. You know, I'm tired of having to wrestle this thing to the ground. Well, you know what you're doing is you're refusing to obey God. You're not willing to pay the price so that your family can be made whole. Dear people, we're supposed to honor our wives. And we're supposed to make sure that we do well together with our wives according to knowledge. And that we also recognize they're the weaker vessel. <laughs> And the weaker vessel is clearly described by Paul in the fact that a woman has a greater susceptibility for whatever reason. I don't understand it. I just go with the scripture towards deception. A man is given the responsibility to understand what God wants and to hold that course. And so when the woman starts thinking perhaps maybe this thing or that thing that is contrary to the word of God, maybe she's a, because she's so much more sensitive, she's offended by somebody in the church or offended by someone who's a family member and it's beginning to create strife and emulation and, and all kinds of problems between the relatives, the husband's able to step in and say, no, that's not the way it is. You're misinterpreting it. You're being way too sensitive. And he's able to set the course properly. And then ultimately, when the, when the children need serious corporal punishment, when they, are, when they have earned, when they have tr- sincerely deserved a, a, a time of, of, of a um, serious spanking, there is nobody who's more effective to do that than the guy because he's not going to in any way uh, hold back from the proper types of discipline because of, a, of the child uh, screaming and crying and being overly sensitive to the situation. The man should, by virtue of his divine order and the gifting that God has given him to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, be able to uphold the word of God and do the things exactly the way the word of God has told him to do it. And in divine order, so that anointing and that divine ability then flows to the wife well, what if the the man's not willing to follow the lord and he's not walking with god well the woman she can step up the lord's going to touch her the lord's going to bless her but once again that is that it shouldn't be the focus of our conversation it shouldn't be the focus of our life the focus of what we do in the church and what we pay attention to is the divine order which god has set up and that is that the man is following the lord jesus with all of his heart So roles and responsibilities, as it is here outlined, is um, first and foremost underscored by 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3. If we give an an, all attention and, and reverence to the fact that the Father is the head of the Lord Jesus Christ and that the Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the man, and that the man is the head of the woman, then we now come into an understanding of proper authority structure. We come into an understanding of a divine order that will absolutely bless us. Now, I know that there are some guys out there that think that their wife is supposed to do whatever they say. Well, that is completely out of the context of what we're talking about here in Scripture. We're talking about the man leading his family in the kingdom of God. We're not talking about the man demanding his wife to go out there and polish the rims on his, on his wheels. And that she better obey. And if she doesn't obey, she's out of divine order and in rebellion. Has absolutely nothing to do with what we're talking about. Completely and totally contrary to the purposes of God. Men who aren't really following the Lord Jesus Christ. Who aren't really uh, stepping up and obeying God like they ought to. They have no right to to demand their wives to stay home from church to make sure that they get their lunch. 
That is completely and totally out of the context of what we're talking about here. We're talking about families who belong to the kingdom of God, families who belong to the local church, families who are, who are dedicated to raising children that are going to change the world because they're going to walk in divine giftings and divine blessings and the anointing which the Holy Spirit has uh, supplied. So, I mean, there has to be a sincerity. There has to be a truth. There has to be a right context here when we're going after this. And so, uh, when we start listening, listing these things, let's list them with that kind of uh, view of what we're talking about. Let's list them in, in, in view of uh, an authority that none of us are going to despise. Jesus will never despise the authority of the Father. I don't believe he'll ever have one moment or ever has had one moment. I know he will never have one moment of thinking that the Father isn't leading him in the right direction or that the Father doesn't love him or that the Father hasn't got it right or the Father's missing it. My goodness, Women, when your husbands are constantly in the church and seeking the Lord and their faces on the ground before the Lord, you should pay all attention even that much more to every move they make because there is a supply of the Spirit coming to them that you absolutely do not want to be without. And just think about it. As you connect, so do the children. The children connect because there is a connection between the man and the children that will only happen through the wife, through the woman. The woman is the one who's called to rule her house, to to have everything in order, to have everything fixed up and and everything uh, supplied to all of the needs of her household. And it's the husband then who's resourcing uh, the wife and the household and has that place of rulership just above uh, the the wife and the woman of the house. Even as Christ Jesus (laughs) has that rulership, this over man, over the man, which then, of course, affects the woman, affects the wife, and then affects the children. If the man wasn't in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ, look how terribly out of order that house is. Those children aren't going to be raised up to be everything that they're supposed to be in God. And that's why you need to be very careful when you're making a decision about who you're going to marry. You better be very certain that you're marrying somebody who's devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ, who knows how to take a stand and not be moved. Otherwise, your dream of having the sanctuary of a house and raising children that are going to be children that are anointed of the Lord and are going to impact the earth, it's never going to be realized. Your, your dream of having um, a happy home uh, that is filled with the praises of the Lord and the blessings of God is never going to be realized. Because the, the divine order is not there. Just as, it, just as that relationship would be impacted in the household if the man wasn't in submission to the Lord Jesus Christ because there wouldn't be a flowing on the proper divine order of that glory and of that anointing through him to his whole household even so if a woman is not submitted to her husband there is going to be an effect of that divine order flowing from the man to his wife even down into his children there's nobody going to lay hands on your children like your wife And there's nobody you, as a husband, should be laying your hands on in a positive way, in a a, a way of blessing, in a way of nurturing like your wife. Husbands, make sure that you understand there is is no uh, more important disciple for you than your wife. And some woman comes along and says, well, I know more than he does. Well, maybe you, maybe you do. But maybe in reality, you just think you do. And reality comes to beckon here. And I'm going to tell you that God has given an authority and an anointing and a special gifting of insight to the man to be able to teach his wife. Now you understand why, why Paul said the women are not to speak in the church. Let them be silent and let them ask their own husbands at home. I know this goes, this goes over like a lead balloon. I mean, in this modern age, with such feminism, with such rebellion, with such defiance of authority on every level, nobody wants to hear this. 
And we want to bring it down to intellect. Listen, hear me plainly. I believe that women are smarter than men. By and large, I truly believe that. It has absolutely nothing to do with the spiritual gifting and empowerment that the Lord gives that goes way beyond human intellect and, and human ability. And that's, that's what we're dealing with here. We're, we're dealing with the reality that God has placed divine revelation, divine insight, that when the word of the Lord goes forth, there is, there is something, there is a connection, there is an impartation that is available to the man that then will flow to the wife. Now, the, 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 the daughter says, oh, no, I'm not married about uh, yet. What about me? No problem. It's flowing to you through your dad whom you're in submission to, who's an authority over your life. <laughs> and, you know, dear, dear folks, I, I don't know what it's going to take for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to wake up, but we're living in days of hand, high-handed anarchy. We're living in a day where people don't believe in the authority of the church. They don't believe in the authority of nothing. They only believe in the authority of that what's going to throw them in jail or give them a ticket. And that's the only means by which they're willing to obey and willing to respond. That's got to come to an end. That has to come to an end in those uh, lives of, of, of that, that listen to me, that are here in this place. You know, in fact, it is no wonder that the place is not packed out because Satan will fight against this with everything that he has. It's just like this. Satan attacks the individual, but that's not where his real fight is. Satan's real fight is against the church. Satan's main point of attack is against the authority of the church. It's all about authority. Satan wants to undermine authority. If he can undermine authority, if he can discredit authority, if he can bring it to ruin, to where that people will not listen, well, there's simply going to be no divine order. And where there's going to be no divine order, no submission to the things of God, look, we're, become, we're just barren and we're destitute. Where do you think that starts? <laughs> It starts on the order of children and the way they respond to their parents. And it begins there and then they grow up and, it, and then that develops in and matures in to the way, to way that the woman responds to her husband. That ultimately develops and matures in to how the husband has a strong dedication and commitment to the things which are right and demands his household to follow the Lord. Understand, it was Joshua, not Joshua's wife, who said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It was Abraham whom God said, I'm going to bless Abraham because I know he will command his children. He didn't say, I'm going to bless Abraham because I know Sarah will command, his, command her children. It's not the way it works. Go read the Bible. God's divine order is absolutely clear. The instructions are absolutely certain. Fact of it is, rebellion in the household will create rebellion in the children. They won't walk with the Lord. They won't walk with the Lord like they could. For example, if a child is raised up in the kind of household where the anointing and the glory of God is so present because the divine order is there, because the proper roles and responsibilities and governorship of the house is recognized and given place to, that child can step right into a gifting and a power of God and authority and a place in the kingdom. Instead of taking half to most of their lifetime to finally learn how to walk in obedience and submission to the authority of the Holy Ghost. Because what it comes down to is if you don't come under the authority in the framework of man, in the human framework, it prevents you from coming under the authority of the divine framework or the spiritual framework of things. If you can't be in submission to your husband, you can't be in submission to the Holy Ghost. Oh, people hate to hear this. Just the truth. 
Reality of it is, is what every pastor ought to do is they, everyone ought to rise up and throw every per- person out of the church who does not want to walk in this kind of divine order so that we can get on with things. But who's going to do that? Not too many people are going to do that because there are not going to be too many people left in any church. And so what we do is, in the sake of mercy, we just go along and we accommodate people. I won't accommodate. I will continually focus on ministering to the problem until a change comes. And then ultimately there comes a time and a place in my life where I confront. Because I'm doing this for a reward. I'm doing this more than for a reward. I'm doing this out of a divine gifting and a heavenly call and a divine uh, um, power that has been given to me to obey the Lord. (laughs) And so if I weren't willing to observe what God has commanded, I don't get to function in the divine gifting. I don't get to have the same relationship. I don't get to have the same fellowship. Because I'm not in obedience and under the authority of my head. Women, there's so many women who want to have an intimacy with their husbands. They want to have this perfect relationship with their husbands. They want the romance and all the other good things that are supposed to be there. But they don't want to walk in the kind of submission and observance to divine authority that makes that a natural reality. Something that just happens, it just unfolds because you're willing to obey God. God makes it happen. It just, it's, it is that part that has to be there in order for the marriage to function right. We want to try to make it up as we go. We want to try to reinvent the wheel, reinvent the rules. No, it ain't going to work. What you're going to do is you're going to discover that all you've done is kicked against the pricks. All you've done is fight against the blessings of the Lord. All you've done is overlooked his simple and blessed remedy for every one of us having marriages made in heaven, having days of heaven on earth, living to make each other happy. These roles and responsibilities, this leadership role, my goodness, it isn't something to despise. It's not something to sit around and debate. It's something just to submit to as much as we should, as much as we should submit to the fact that Jesus died for us at Calvary. That's how we should, that's, that's the effect it should have on us. So listing out some of these things. And the roles and responsibilities of a, of a household. It's, it's absolutely essential that each person realizes this is what God requires. These div- divine principles are what God requires. There, someone said to me, well, my husband, he loves the Lord, but he just doesn't lead. Oh, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're going to have to reevaluate what you mean by that. And once again, understanding that there's different kinds of leadership models. There's different kinds of leadership examples. And maybe your husband has a more passive leadership um, uh, way of doing things. And and model that he, he follows just because his nature is simply more gentle than a strong leader who's constantly pushing and shoving. Well, which one do you want? And then let God show you as you submit to the leadership how that you can become, a, how, how that that act of submission comes along and brings a completion to that man, to your husband, and makes his leadership more effective. And then as you as you submit yourself together, as that relationship grows and as that relationship matures, you discover yourself actually changing and maturing and being com- becoming more that, that perfect um, example of leadership. So that by the time you're a grandfather, you know exactly how to raise kids. But don't worry. Somebody said, what are we going to do in the meantime? Oh, just because you were willing to observe divine principles, doesn't matter that you did it wrong uh, from time to time. Doesn't matter that you didn't know what you were doing from time to time. Because God saw your obedience. God saw the divine place and the divine order and the divine uh, um, uh, recognition of God's way of doing things in your heart and and in the day-to-day commitments of your life. He took up all your slack. He blessed you and did those things which is only possible for him to do anyways. 
He works the miracle for all you kids to turn out right. He works the miracle for you to have long and blessed lives where the husband and wife don't end up in separate rooms, sleeping in separate beds for any reason. How are you listening to me? Too much of that stuff goes on. And, 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 and dear ladies, if you rule your household, guess what? Your daughters are going to rule their household too. And all you're doing is perpetuating and modeling an anarchy and a despite against divine order and the divine principles of God. And do you think you're not going to be held responsible for that? That you give rise to a continual perpetuation of rebellion from generation to generation? Someone said, oh, we're just strong women. Be strong all you want. Just get yourself submitted. Oh, we're just strong in, in, our, in our concept and perspective of things. Be strong in your concept and perspective of things all you want. Just make sure that you're walking in humility and obeying your husband. And looking to him for leadership. And letting him cast vision. And don't tell him what the preacher said. Let him, let him tell you what the preacher said. Recognize where the flow of ministry takes place. Isn't to say that you can't come along and give counsel. Isn't say isn't to say that, that God's not going to give you divine revelation. Isn't to, it is not to say that the Holy Spirit isn't going to speak through you. But the bottom line of it is, if that heart of submission isn't isn't inside of you, if that humility isn't inside of you, you can bet you God's not talking through you. You can be certain you're getting no revelation. You can be certain you are not yielded or submitted to the Holy Ghost. And anything you are getting is probably from a devil. And on the order of a, of a familiar spirit. And not something of divine revelation. That is how important God's divine rules are. Somebody said, oh, it's not that bad. Oh, yeah, it is. Because it is on the same order of a man in submission to Christ. If a man is not in submission to Christ, you think he's going to be speaking by the Holy Ghost? You think he's going to be getting divine revelation? You think he's going to be getting insight? Not a chance. Not a chance. And then, you know, I can take this back on the roles and responsibilities of men. In leadership. Because there's so many men sitting in churches across the world. And especially in this nation. Who are not in submission to the authority that is there in their pastor. They're constantly criticizing their pastor. They're constantly stepping out and, and having something to say because they've got a superior insight. You know what you're doing? You're breeding dissension for your own household. Don't wonder why your wife constantly comes up against you and tells you you don't know what you're talking about, fat mouth. Or something else like that. Some uh, other obnoxious thing in the moment of crisis. Because you're constantly doing it to your pastor. Which is a head over you because your pastor represents Christ. And in fact, that is an authority structure that is absolutely essential for you to recognize. Somebody wants to just, just somehow, they want to disassociate the pastor from Jesus. You can never do it. Not in divine order. Can never do it. Because the ministry are his mouthpiece. that He gave special gifting to and set in the church. Oh, well, you want it your way. You want your wife to be so submissive and listen and cooperate and come together with you and pull together and be a team because that's what's going to make the difference in your house. Well, you know, you're right. That is what's going to make the difference in your house. But if you don't do it in the church and if you don't do it to the authority structure that God has placed over you, forget about it, man. Because every spiritual act breeds after its own kind, just like giraffes make little baby giraffes. Everything produces after its own kind. Sedition, rebellion, defiance, arrogance, dissension of any sort produces a whirlwind of corruption. Because it's just as much of sowing to the flesh as anything else is. And the result of those seeds are not going to be good. People are going to have to recognize, look, 
It is a divine order that has to be observed in every dimension, not just in a couple, not just in a few areas. So the roles and responsibilities, the head of the household on page two, we've got number one, men you need to be a follower of Christ. If you want to see things work right, I'm talking about you getting into the leadership program that God has designed for you. You can only be mentored in this leadership program that God has designed for you because you're willing to follow Jesus. Otherwise, you're just lost. You're off wandering around, meandering around, constantly making wreckage and ruin. But if you're following Christ, then you're being mentored by the best leader on in the universe and what's going to happen is you're going to become the best leader the most effective leader and the results of good leadership is blessings for all it's prosperity at every level it's success at every level it's your responsibility guys to be the leader of your family to recognize that you are not going to back down from this listen it's not a dicta- it's not a dictatorship it's not an some kind of of, you know, tyrannical rule, but it is a rulership of love and it is a rulership of certainty and it's a, and it's a rulership that recognizes, listen, we have no time to lose here. So it is, it, it, it is an immediate leadership. It's a leadership that you recognize that you have for your wife. It is a leadership that you recognize you have for your children and it's an uncompromising, unwavering leadership. You're learning directly from Jesus and you know what has to be done. You know the principles that have to be followed. You just heard from Jesus. He's showing you and your, your relationship with him that disobedience isn't going to work, that rebellion isn't going to work, that doing things in, in a way that seems right to man, that is fashioned after the world, is only going to bring destruction. So you take your place and you say, listen, wife, we're not doing it that way. You say, you take your place and you say, listen, children, this is the way it's going to be. You, you are vocal. Leadership that takes the responsibility for their family is very vocal. It's urgent. It can't be put off for later. This is one area that you don't want to in any way procrastinate and wait for later. It's urgent. It must be dealt with now. It cannot allow to go. It cannot be allowed to continue on. Where do you get those divine rules? Where do you get those divine principles? Where do you get those divine insights? Where do you know which way to turn? What actions and what attitudes to to allow? And what actions and attitudes to disallow? Because you're learning from the best leader in the universe. Jesus Christ. Being brought to you directly by the Holy Spirit. Amazing, isn't it? Husbands, your responsibility your role as a husband is to cleave to your wife. You cleave into your wife, your eyes aren't going to be running around everywhere else. You cleave into your wife, you're going to be defending her. You're not going to listen to anybody tell you something, say something bad about your wife and then you agree with them. <laughs> Put down your wife. No, my goodness. Each, each person in the marriage, the husband and the wife, they have to be the most ardent defenders of each other, the, the best promoters of each other. They should be so in love with each other that there is absolutely no place to find fault. And when you do find fault, you you do start seeing problems, you start working those things out. But it's not going to be just some kind of arbitrary problem that you're seeing. It's going to be some fault that would be real, something that would be defined as contrary to the ways of God and the will of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My wife's not running around in a miniskirt. My wife's not going to go on to the beach in a bikini. Ain't no way. You hear me? Do you, are you listening to me now? Some of you women. Who's, your husband told you time and time again. I can only hope that you're listening on the web tonight. I can only hope. I can only, faith is subs, evidence of things not seen. You know, subs, things hope for the evidence of th- things not seen. No. You, you obey your husband. Go run around acting like that being like that goodness gracious huh husband sees something wrong you take care of it you 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 demand it my girls well there may have been times that they had some 
had some variations on the theme. But when, what dad has to say is this. It's board shorts and a tank top. Okay? Hey, look, we got to come in our house. We can't allow things that we see this wrong and out of order to continue on. Just because everybody else on the block is doing it. Just because everybody else at the school is doing it. We aren't everybody else. <laughs> we belong to the kingdom of God. We're not the followers. We're the leaders. If a man is going to lead, then his wife is going to be a good leader. And if she's going to lead because he leads, then guess what? The kids are all going to be good leaders. So when they get to, when they get to school, they're not going to be overwhelmed by all this peer pressure and then accommodate everybody's idea of things and be followers. They're going to be strong leaders. They're going to say, here's where we are and this is where we stand. We will not be moved. The world, and in this, especially this nation, needs leaders. Somebody said, oh, make sure all you Christian families that you don't all go to home schools uh, because otherwise then what's going to happen in public schools? There's not going to be any strong Christian examples. Well, look, unfortunately, we haven't been having homes that are raising up and mentoring in the homes strong leadership within their children to be strong examples. Have you ever been to a public school system? Man, they'll eat you alive the first day. Unless you have been developed by your parents, which is only possible because they observe divine orders and divine principles and follow God with all of the heart. It is only then you raise strong leaders. People look at their kids, get all disappointed. I can't believe you acted like that. I, I raised you to be a strong leader. No, you didn't. You never obeyed your husband hardly ever. Like revival time, you, were, you obeyed him. Or when you got in a car accident, about died, then you obeyed him for about a week because you was humbled enough. Huh? When they let you out of prison, you obeyed for about two weeks or whatever the situation was. There's no room for compromise on these things. We must recognize that God has more wisdom than all the rest of us. He's got more wisdom than the latest uh, uh, manual that came out on, on how to raise your kids by the best uh, psychologist on the earth. He's got more wisdom than all of the uh, feminists who tell you that you are being stripped of who you are and your identity and being disallowed to truly live the life that you've been so blessed with that you allow somebody else to be so influential in your life. Nonsense. Fact of it is, God says, women, your body's not your own. It belongs to your husband. And husbands... Your body is not your own. It belongs to your wife. Because you don't have two independent lives anymore. You have one life. Pretty radical, isn't it? But who realizes that? The only, the only people that realize these things, the only people that realize these things are those whose hearts tremble at the word of God, who hunger and thirst after righteousness, who desire more than anything else to please Father, who desire more than anything else to be used by Him and to realize all the blessings of this overwhelming glory that comes into our life and produces these abilities, these divine abilities that allow us to represent Him and live something of a life that is superior to everything that is in the world and just like the life, or nearly, if not, just like the life that is in heaven. Boy, I hope, you can real, I hope you can believe that what I'm saying is not a fairy tale here tonight. That a man leaves all others. You know, it, it, it's tough as your children are starting to leave the home and get married. But when you recognize divine principles, mom doesn't start going in there, and especially mother-in-law doesn't start going in there and interfering uh, because that, uh, that son is so special to her. And now she just, uh, just forgets about divine order and, and forgets about the fact that the man cleaves into his wife, tries to get in the middle and tries to finagle around, ultimately creates strife and envy and, di and division within the home and it continues to perpetuate itself to the, till, she, till she's dead and gone. But by that time, there's been so much problems made. 
Can you hear what I'm saying? It never stops. It never stops. Being out of order, not willing to obey God, not willing to listen to his, to his word, not willing to tremble at his word, not willing to observe the things and the divine principles that he's laid out will not stop. It won't stop. He will follow you to the grave and all you'll do is continue to create problems. All you'll do is continue to create disasters. That's why we do not allow anything at all in our lives that is contrary to, to Father's rules and His divine order. When we see it, we, we immediately correct it and catch it. Does that mean to say that a wife doesn't correct, correct and catch problems with the man? No, she does. <laughs> I've been straightened out a number of times by my wife and even by my children at times. Oh, because it doesn't matter when your heart is hungry and thirsty for the things of God and for the things of His word. It doesn't matter who you hear it from. It doesn't matter who points it out. Your heart is so hungry. Your soul is so thirsty. You drink it like water and receive it with such, with such, with such thanksgiving that you don't even recognize that it was your three-year-old daughter. Huh? Much more your wife. Huh? It's not like, well, you can't tell me. No, that's, no that doesn't even exist. Arrogance like that. These kinds of things that we will want to ride in to this wonderful and beautiful divine order of a man being the head of a household. That stuff doesn't even exist in the nature of God's divine order because the nature of God's rule is modeled for us by the lowliness, by the dedication, by the love, by the self-sacrifice of Jesus. So we got to make sure, and we're talking about these roles and responsibilities, we're keeping them in context. We're keeping them in view of heaven. We're keeping them in view of Jesus, in view of the ways of God, and the ways of the Spirit of God. (laughs) Amen. And then the fourth thing I have in this outline, in terms of the role of the husband, is to recognize that when you're going to serve in ministry, when you're going to serve in the church at any, at, on any level of leadership, God demands perfection. He demands that not only are you a, a person who has a great reputation, but he says you got to be perfect. You got to be blameless. That's what he says. He says, your wife has got to be in order. Your wife has got to be an example. She's got to be a leader, a person who's also in submission to the word and walking in submission to you. And your children, they have got to be children that are well put together, proper children who are obedient children, who are doing those things that are right in the eyes of the Lord and in the eyes of the church. Well, I say that that should be extended to every person because I'm looking at every person in the church as a leader. In fact, if it is, the only people I'm not looking in the church as being leadership are those who just came in. Are those who just recently got, gave in, have, have given their lives to Jesus. And we're on our way to make disciples out of them so that they, and teach them to observe everything that the Lord has commanded so that they too will take that place of leadership. So I'm going to encourage you and as you're going over this handout, if you're going, as you're going over the study, even in the future, spend time in 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 13 and Titus 1, 5 through 9, looking at those requirements. I guarantee you the scripture tells me, said, the scripture tells me, if I cannot rule, speaking to me, my own household, that's what God expects. God expects me to rule my household. Not accommodate, not facilitate, not to try to be a coach, to rule. There's a big difference between a coach and a ruler. Big difference between a ruler and a facilitator. Jesus was a ruler and is a ruler. And he ruled so well by the way he led. So, dear people, grab a hold of that. Understand the requirements. Understand women, once again, uh, let me just put it on you. 
I've had to go take people to my office and look at it. Look at a husband and wife and say, look at the husband and say, you called to preach. There's no question about it. There's an anointing on your life. And look at the wife and say, and he's not allowed to so long as you're so messed up. So you are keeping the gifting and the calling of God from being able to function, operate in his life because you're not willing to simply walk with God, obey God. And fundamentally, every household problem I've always seen in counseling always comes back to the woman wants to be in charge. She won't be submitted. And as soon as you try to bring, they say, oh, well, we want restoration. We want to get this thing healed. We want to get this right. And as soon as you try to bring that, that prating woman into a place of submission, all hell breaks loose. And of course, it's all his fault. But it isn't. It's as reproducible as a sun coming up in the morning. Women, don't get yourself in that, in that mess. Don't you get yourself in that spiritual mess. And remember, deception is a terrible thing. Deception makes you right even when God's telling you in your face you're wrong. Can you get that? Be sensitive to the word, please. Be sensitive. Allow God the Holy Ghost to train you to be sensitive to his voice by always obeying the word, being sensitive to the word. Don't go try to figure out what the word of God says. Accept it for face value. Please. Amen. And so I, I've, in, in large part, I've already covered the responsibilities of a, of a husband. I'm, but I want to run through them real quick. And then, of course, in your outline, I've given you a lot of verses of Scripture. Love your wives as Christ loved the church. What a model. He gave himself for it. He nurtures it. He ever lives to make intercession for it. It's always hands-on. It's not just, you know, hey, every once in a while dropping in and seeing how things are doing. It's continual relationship. It's continual mentoring. It's continual conversation. It's continual dialogue. It's continual interaction. It's a continual growth. It's a continual development. It's continual patience. It's continual affection. It's continual long-suffering. Just look at the model. It's a lot of offenses and still saying, I love you just as much as I loved you before. It's a lot of problems and God's still saying, I'm there for you. I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. If men would love their wives as Christ loved the church, there absolutely would never be a divorce. Lay down your life for your wife. Give honor unto your wife. Provide for your family. You know, one person said, it was said by, um, by one woman, a bad husband's better than no husband at all. So understand, you might have all these kinds of problems with your husband, think he just adds this and that and the other thing. But look at him, he's providing for you. Look at him, he's running 12, 14 hours a day trying to, do, to, to make all the finances that, that, that you need to keep the house straight. To keep everything going. Everybody's clothed and fed and properly taken care of. I, I found over and over again that as I've counseled people, most of the problems were such minor problems. I, 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 I give people assignments like this. I want you to journal every day for me because I want to read your journals. And all I see in the journals is negative stuff. What do I immediately know? I immediately know that they rarely see all the good things that are going on. In fact, when I have done an analysis of it at a spot check from time to time, I discovered that in most cases, 90% of the interaction is positive. 10% of it, by and large, is negative, And they don't even recognize the 90%. It's all just a 10%. It's completely upside down. Satan makes it that way. We're going to have to get wise enough and, 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 and full of the spirit enough to no longer allow Satan to throw these crazy, deceptive uh, uh, lies in our way and play these crazy, deceptive tricks on us. If you don't journal, give you an opportunity, you know, to start right now. You should do it. You should find out whether or not you always just go to your journal when you're mad and upset and writing two and a half inch letters. Huh? Or whether or not when you're done at the end of the week and you're reviewing your journal, you're looking at, at how many things are good in your household. God tells us, he says, forget not all the benefits. Forget not all the blessings. Because the reality of it is, is too many people, unfortunately, probably the majority of people, forget all of the time. 
Well, in this realm of love and affection, you're rather focused on all that you have been blessed with because you are people given to thanksgiving, not to unthankfulness. Well, we find over and over again that the way you find primarily fix problems in your household is you get out of unthankfulness and you start becoming thankful. You start becoming thankful for, somebody said thankful for what? Thankful for everything. And especially those little things that you constantly don't pay any attention to. I told one person, they were telling me about how bad things are. I said, okay, right now, I want you to pack up. I want you to move up to the mountains. You're going to go into the back wilderness of the mountains of Montana in five foot of snow and you're going to drop the car off. You're going to hike in 30 miles and that's it. That's all you got. You, your wife, and your 10 kids. I'm going to tell you how many ki- kids I w- this person has because I don't want you to guess something I was talking to. So they don't have 10 kids. I mean, because I really said this. Then he got it. He started thinking, well, if I was out there in the middle of the snow, four foot of snow in the mountains, trying to survive off nature, and here's my kids cold and naked, and no provision. My goodness, I'm starting to get it. I'm thankful for so many things all of a sudden. Why don't you stay with that till it becomes indelibly, indelibly imprinted upon your mind? So that you never forget it for the rest of your life and then continue every, continue every day add something to the list. Well, if you're journaling, you need to journal for a purpose. And those are the kinds of purposes that you want. You want to be tracking yourself to see if you're getting better. To see if you're getting over your disease of unthankfulness. Your, your disease of deception where you're seeing all the wrong, all the problems. Instead of seeing all the right and all the answers and provision. I hope that makes sense to you. Provision does go way beyond just supplying material things. That provision is more effective in its spiritual supply and in its affection and its love and its tenderness. Guys have to learn how to be tender to their wives. I mean, that is a special art developed in the, uh, among the uh, male species. Empower your wife as Christ empowers the church. Be the advocate for your wife. Be an intercessor for your wife. Oh, dear folks, don't just wait and pray for your wife when you got a problem. Pray, pray for your kids when you got a problem. Lay your hands on your wife. Pray for her continually. Lay your hands on your children. Pray for them, at least on a daily basis. In your time of prayer, the, the, who should be top on your prayer list? Your wife and then your kids. Believing God for all the things that they need. And believing God. Man, I, I tell you right now, one of the biggest things is I wanted my daughters to, to, to prophesy. Like Philip had four daughters that prophesied. That was so important to me. I wanted that. I, I, my girls got to be prophets. I want my children flowing in the anointing. I want them wide open for the spirit of God. I want, them to, I want them the giftings and the divine abilities to be able to stand against all the snares of the enemy. I want my wife to have the wisdom and the insight to be able to function right alongside of me because I know it's going to take two to make it happen. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. Don't forget it. It takes two to make this happen. It takes two to make it right. And it takes two to make it wrong. There's nothing else you get tonight. Take that one. Takes two to make it right. Takes two to make it wrong. The role of the wife, she's a helpmate, counterpart, image, and glory of man. Amazing. When you look over your wife and say, that's, that's the image and glory. That, there's my image and my glory right there. Huh? I'm going to make sure that she's looking good. Make sure that, you know, I'm... I'm I'm doing everything I possibly can to find that kind of value there, that kind of blessing there, that kind of honor there, that kind of, uh, of goodness there. Don't let that slip away. Women, once again, first and foremost responsibility, just as it is with a man, you be a follower of Jesus. Because if you're not a good follower of Jesus, you're not going to be a good follower of your husband. You're not telling Jesus what to do. Huh? You're not telling Jesus he got it wrong. You're not tell, arguing with Jesus about why it's not supposed to be that way. Argue, argue, argue. Listen, if there's arguing going, I want you to know that's sin. God did not call a woman to argue. When I said a woman should be the executive coach, I wasn't talking about being an arguer. Someone who quarrelsome, 
Well, someone has constantly got a complaint. No, ma'am. There is no arguing in the counsels of the Lord. Submission has not one sentence of argument in it. You can say that and repeat that after me. Everybody that's out there in the web that I know and believe in God's listening. Father, we pray in the name of Jesus that they're listening. Women, you've got to be a good follower of Jesus if you're going to be a good follower of your husband. And you're going, you're, going to lead Jesus as, you're going to lead your husband as much as you lead Jesus. You can say that. I'm going to lead my husband as much as I lead Jesus. Huh? You weren't empowered to lead your husband. Can you get that? You weren't empowered. We, we, are, we are able to walk on two legs because God empowered us. We're able to talk and have this wonderful speech because God empowered us. He did not empower a dog to talk. He empowered a dog to bark. Ooh, I can just hear humanism growling. It's the way it is. It's the way it is. Deborah understood it. That's why she tried so hard to talk Israel out of making her a leader. She said, this is ridiculous. It is to your shame to make me your leader. You bunch of women. Is basically what she was saying. Is there no man among you? Go read it. God did not empower women to lead. He empowered them to come into a place of submission and following their husband. And through that, there is an empowerment now to lead. They can lead their households. And then they, they, there's leadership areas also in the church. There's women. Understand, there is women been raised up with mighty anointings. Every one of them that I know of were under the authority of the proper authority of their husband or of their father or of the ministry that was set over them. I allow women to minister here in this church because I see them complete, completely and totally submitted to leadership and completely and su totally submitted to authority. And out of that, then they are empowered to lead. Do you understand that? No. You need some more conversation on it. You need some more discussion. I'm sure... Just allow, allow it to soak into you for a little while. Women, it's, the role of the woman is to rule over the house. And once again, I've given you a lot of scripture here. She looks well to the affairs of her household, just like the woman in Proverbs 31. She looks well to the affairs of her household, not someone else's, not the park bench not you know um the uh you know the club down there at the uh, gym gym uh or or, or wherever else uh, she likes to uh, frequently hang out with all of her friends she sees well to her own household mm. so i so you're you're taking all my life away from you no i'm empowering you to step into it i'm showing you another kind of life I'm showing you a way uh, that belongs to the kingdom of God that will cause you to do something far more than you ever hoped to do. Listen, dear people, if you're going to have children, your lives should be devoted to them, that you're, having, you're blessed by the Lord to participate in raising up champions, people who are right, to, that God will work through, who will bring those provisions uh, that only... Um, those children that are raised like Joseph can bring to a world in famine. Yeah. And everybody said amen. The responsibility of a wife. Well, once again, let me just emphasize that that, that uh, role of the wife is elevated as soon as her husband takes a place of leadership. As soon as she's she is a, a woman whose husband, the wife of a, of a man who sits in the gate, who sits in the place of leadership from the Old Testament all the way through the New Testament. There is an absolute demand for a character, a disposition that is an example of the kingdom of God. Otherwise, 
the man is ruined. He's just ruined. Forget about it. He's not allowed to take that position because it's a defamation against the name of Jesus and the church of the Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of God. Somebody said, oh, you're putting too much responsibility on me. He, this, this is more than I can bear. No. Repent. Call upon the name of the Lord. Say, Lord, I'm poor and needy. And he will come and he will save you. And he'll give you a divine ability to be able to do all of this. The responsibility of a wife. Your desire is to be to your husband. Not to your best friend. Not to your dad. Not to your mother or anyone else. Your desire is to your husband. And he rules over that desire. You know, listen, make sure that you're keeping things in proper order in your affections. Don't allow things to drift off. Don't go finding, you don't go, women, you don't go to somebody else for counsel. Go to your husband for counsel. Come on. Well, I'm, I'm, I, I, I trust this person over here more. They've got more insight, more wisdom. No, the person that God empowered to bless you, to guide you, to counsel you is your husband. Nobody else. Some woman came to me. She said, oh, pastor, I want to be in submission to you. I said, I don't want you to be in submission to me. Scripture says, be in, says, wives, be in submission to your own husband. You get your husband in submission to me, you'll be fine. Should I say that again? <laughs> oh, pastor, I want to be in submission to you. No. Scripture says, wives, be in submission to your own husbands. Get the rulership. Get the authority structure. Get the authority structure right. Get the divine principles right. Wives, if you're in submission to your husband, you'll automatically be in submission to the church. You'll automatically be right with God. You'll automatically be plugged in, connected, hooked up, and flowing in everything that God has to provide to us through that supply that flows down from the head to every part of the body. Boy, I hope you can get it. I hope you hear the resounding responsibility for the strict recognition of God's structure, authority structure. Responsibility of the wives. Be willing to follow the leadership. Submit. After all, God will hold you responsible. Number Understand, to be, he, he, will, he will hold you responsible for a number of things that I listed for. To be supportive. To obey your husbands. To love your husbands. To love your children. And that love is not defined by so many ways in which the world would define it or give examples of. But that love is strictly defined by the way Jesus loves by the way God loves, that you're willing to sacrifice your own self, time, all the things you like to do for yourself because you rather pour it into your children just like God pours it into us. How he sacrificed everything so we could have everything he's got. That is the kind of love and devotion that needs to be there, that needs to be, you need to be willing to express. Amen. That's the roles and responsibilities. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you give us the power and the divine ability to do it. Lord, we, every one of us, we look to you, we hear your word. We simply say in that responsiveness, that obedient and tender heart, Lord, we will do it. Lord, we will obey you. And we know then, Father, that you will come and you will strengthen us and you will give us divine ability and divine insight to do it exactly the way that you planned it out when you first created Adam and formed him and breathed into his breath, nostrils, the breath of life, and then from him built that companion, that counterpart, that wife that was to be everything that would complete the definition of a family that you, define, that you described, that you invented, that you created, and Lord, that you have ordered at this moment in time for each of our lives. Lord, may each husband understand his wife in the framework of how you love the church. And may each wife understand her husband within the framework of how you created her. You created her through the man. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Amen.